Boys to Men and Shy dominated the early 90s with their soulful harmonies and songs about love and heartache. But within a few years, a different form of R&B grabbed everyone's attention. Jodeci changed the game with their raunchy and explicit lyrics infused with a hip-hop vibe that sent shockwaves through the industry. This moment in music history just so happened to be the perfect opportunity for an emerging trio called H-Town to show the world what they were made of. Plucked from obscurity and pushed into the limelight, Solomon Shazam Connor, Kevin Dean O'Connor, and Daryl G.I. Jackson dominated the charts, all while making the ladies go wild. H-Town became the biggest independent R&B group, but their time at the top was short-lived. This is a story about the shady record industry, financial issues, an untimely passing, and an RRG bombshell that might shock some of H-Town's biggest fans. Don't forget, you can gain access to this audio and one unreleased super messy video per month on the RRG Patreon. Details are in the description box. Now, let's get into today's video. Brothers Shazam and Dino grew up in the south side of Houston. At an early age, they began hanging out with the wrong crowd. They were sent to live with their grandmother, and while there, they watched their uncles perform in an R&B group. The brothers developed a love for music, and after recording their own songs, they realized that they actually had good voices. While in high school, they met G.I., who was pursuing a music career of his own. But the three of them didn't link up as a group until after they ended up at the same talent audition for a producer named Philip Blackman. Under Philip's direction and with Shazam as the lead singer, they called themselves The Gents. They released an album called It's No Dream in 1990, but their songs flopped. They met a new producer named Bishop Burrell and hired a manager named Pat Johnson. Pat had a connection with Luke of Miami hip-hop group Two Live Crew. In his autobiography entitled The Book of Luke, Luke said he went to Houston to perform and he met up with Pat. Pat kept bugging him to meet some new singers that he was working with, but Luke wasn't interested. Luke said Pat made him miss his flight back to Miami in order to get him to meet Shazam, Dino, and G.I. In his memoir, Luke said he could tell right away that the boys were, quote, dirt poor. He wrote, The first thing I noticed when I sat down with them was the holes in the bottom of their shoes. They started singing for him in their living room, and Luke was blown away. He decided to sign them to his label called Luke Records. He flew them out to Miami, and when they arrived at his home, Luke said they showed up with nothing. They had no luggage, just the clothes on their backs. Luke said to himself, these guys need help, and they deserve to succeed. It was at that point Luke decided to turn them into stars, and even if his plan failed, he would be content knowing he helped some young guys make their way out of a desperate situation. Luke took them to the mall and bought them each three sets of shoes and some outfits. Then he took them to the barbershop and ended the night by treating them to a very nice dinner. The following week, he bought them a house in Miami so they could stay in town and focus on making a great album. Luke thought the name The Gents was too corny, so they came up with the name H-Town to pay homage to their hometown of Houston. Fever for the Flavor was released in 1993, and the lead single, Knockin' the Boots, landed at number one on the Billboard Hot R&B chart. The album was eventually certified platinum. Shazam told Magic 102.1 they immediately went on the road to do promo, so they didn't realize how fast Knockin' the Boots had blown up. It wasn't until fans began rushing them and tearing down barricades at their shows that they realized they were a big deal. Despite their popularity, they weren't making any money. Back when we first started off, you know, we was really big celebrities, right? But we wasn't making any money. Like, the, the label would give us, like, 160 a week to eat off of. $160? So, yeah, a week. Shazam said he began selling his sweaty clothes and undergarments he wore on stage for $100 a piece to make some extra money. Media outlets were desperate to get in contact with the new bad boys of R&B. And in their interviews, Shazam and Dino referred to themselves as twins and stated their age as 18 years old. However, real reality gossip uncovered some interesting information. Data from the Texas Department of Health, Bureau of Vital Statistics, 
shows the birth of Solomon, a.k.a. Shazam, as December 17, 1973. His arrest info from the state of Texas also confirms his birthday. And Dino's date of birth has been confirmed as November 18, 1974. This means the brothers are actually 11 months apart. Why did they decide to tell everyone they were twins? We're unsure, but Shazam continues to refer to Dino as his twin on social media and even celebrates Dino's birthday as his own. After the release of their first album, they co-headlined the Coca-Cola Summerfest Tour. They won a Soul Train Award for Best New Artist. And we want to say this to y'all, please give me some good love and teamed up with Devontae Swing of Jodeci to record the song Part-Time Lover for the Above the Rim soundtrack. They even got to meet Prince, and according to Shazam, the legendary artist told the group he was a big fan of their music. When it came time to work on their second album, they decided they wanted $500,000 up front. The label agreed, but they were told they had to pay off the houses the label had purchased for them. Shazam said after paying off the mortgages, paying taxes, accountants, and lawyers, they were back to being broke. Dino took on a more creative role for their next album. They released Beggin' After Dark in November 1994, and it was certified gold. The song Emotions reached number 11 on the Billboard chart, and the music video featured Dino being seriously injured in a car accident. During this time, Luke had signed a distribution deal with Relativity Records and their parent company, Sony. And when it came time for everyone to reap the success of H-Town's second album, Luke said Sony and Relativity wouldn't release any money because there were too many losses being reported from Luke's previous distributor. Luke and his record company were forced to file for bankruptcy. Completely fed up with Luke, the label, and the industry as a whole, H-Town appeared on BET's video Soul in shackles. This is how we feel right now. Right. We feel like we should feel. just be convicts in yeah. jail. We Mom's locked down. Call is locked down. And, uh, right the, the, people, the people that we're dealing with that's behind us, they're not behind us. They try right. you know, to destroy our careers, and, you know, we're, we're hold us down. You know, that's how we feel. You know? They told the host, Donnie Simpson, their record company wasn't promoting their sophomore album. Shazam and Dino did most of the talking and made it clear they wanted out of their record contract. Luke said he felt betrayed, but there was nothing that could be done by that point. H-Town left Luke Records and signed with Sony Relativity. They also received $1 million each and 50% of their masters. Finally, they were being compensated what they deserved. They teamed up with Shirley Murdoch and Roger Troutman to record a song for the soundtrack of the Martin Lawrence film, A Thin Line Between Love and Hate. They also began working on their third album. Under Dino's leadership, they produced and wrote the entire album themselves. They left the freaky topics alone and began making music about serious issues. Ladies edition Woman's World was released in 1997, and they dedicated the entire album to Nicole Brown Simpson, O.J. Simpson's ex-wife who lost her life in 1994. The label wasn't happy with the contents of the album. They wanted the group to make the kind of music that sounded similar to Knockin' the Boots. So in an effort to compromise, the group went back into the studio and recorded the track, They Like It Slow. The song was just what they needed to help the album reach gold status. Instead of continuing to promote the album, their label wanted to move on and record a brand new album. They were offered $2 million, but Dino refused to take the deal. He told the label they could either promote their current music or they would never get another album from H-Town. H-Town was officially in breach of their contract at that point, and Shazam attempted to get Dino to reconsider. But Dino stood his ground. Shazam said Dino started to turn down shows on their behalf because he felt H-Town was being taken advantage of by the powers that be. This led to the group going on a hiatus. GI began working on some projects behind the scenes. Shazam released a solo album called Bringing the Heat, and Dino recorded some of his own music. But when people in the industry refused to give Dino's new music a chance because it was so different from the songs he made with H-Town, Dino reportedly isolated himself, withdrew from the public eye, and fell into a deep depression. With the money no longer rolling in, Dino filed for bankruptcy. 
It was Shazam who went to his home and convinced him to head back into the spotlight, promising his brother that performing in front of their fans would help him feel better. Dino agreed, and H-Town reunited in January 2003. They performed at a few shows, and eventually, Dino asked Shazam to help him out with a song called The Day I Die. Shazam told Unsung he didn't agree with his brother speaking about death in that way. In an Instagram post, Shazam said Dino told him he wouldn't be on this earth for much longer. Shazam added that Dino said he was tired of this evil world and was waiting for God to come get him. Weeks later, Shazam began negotiating their new contract with Atlantic Records along with a 30-day tour, and Dino was nowhere to be found. His family later discovered that on January 28, 2003, after leaving the recording studio with his pregnant girlfriend, 22-year-old Tesha Ray Wisent, the Honda Civic Tesha was driving was hit by an SUV that ran a red light. Tesha and their baby lost their life at the scene of the accident, and Dino passed away en route to the hospital. He was 28 years old. He left behind a young daughter named Kaja from a previous relationship. The three people who were in the SUV fled the scene. One man named Juan Diaz was apprehended and faced felony charges of failure to stop and render aid. Following Dino's passing, record labels didn't want to sign H-Town unless they replaced Dino with a new member, but Shazam refused. In 2004, Shazam and G.I. released the album Imitations of Life on their own label, which included some of Dino's pre-recorded music. They took another break, up until 2015 when they released an album called Child Support. Oddly enough, Shazam was locked up for $170,000 in unpaid child support that same year. And three years later, he was locked up again for the same charge. In 2017, they released a mixtape called Call Me Mr. Pac-Man. And in 2019, H-Town was inducted into the R&B Hall of Fame. They now perform as a duo and dedicate every single show to Dino's memory. Let us know if you're surprised by what happened to H-Town. And thanks for watching Real Reality Gossip.